Thank you to our multinational panel there. Now, the global pandemic has changed our approach to managing change itself. So our next panel will share their experiences of successful tech adoptions to help us navigate and to have a heads up on what has and hasn't worked. Welcome to the second session of uh, our Lawyers Open to Technology talk track. Uh, this session is titled Successful Law Firm Adoption Stories, and it is a 30-minute interactive session. Uh, I am Matt James, the VP of Go-To-Market for the Drafting Business Unit here at Latera, uh, and I am joined by two very experienced and credible panelists. Um, so before we jump into the discussion and, and some of the story sharing, uh, I would appreciate if maybe the two of you could introduce yourself and a bit of uh, your background. So why don't we go ahead and start with Mary? Uh, my name is Mary Nearing. I am with Robinson Bradshaw out of Charlotte, North Carolina. I have been there since 1999. Uh, just to subtract a little 11 months when I moved back to Indiana, I got a crazy idea to move where it was cold. Um, in any case, I've been through a lot with Robinson Bradshaw. I started out as their trainer. I was their help desk. I was their help desk manager and I moved into applications and I've been doing applications now for the firm since 2003. Uh, so a lot of rollouts of different products over the years and a lot of experience with all of that. Wonderful. And Rick? Yeah, my name is Rick Thompson. I'm with McAfee and Taft in Oklahoma City, in Oklahoma. I've been here just about two and a half years. Uh, I have been in the CIO uh, legal technology leadership space for nearly 25 years. Uh, prior to that, own, owning a business and consulting. So. Uh, consulting with law law firms prior to uh, my becoming a CIO, uh, working with one. This is my fourth law firm uh, in this role, and uh, just very excited for all the things that we're able to bring to the table and and improve here. Wonderful. And for the audience, uh, I asked both Rick and Mary to join based off of conversations that I had with them throughout uh, the last year, uh, and both of them had a very refreshing um, point of view from my perspective. Uh, it was good to hear that we're all kind of striving in the same direction for uh, success in regards to leveraging technology, but it wasn't the common, um, you know, boilerplate feedback that I had constantly heard uh, in, in other conversations, and I thought it would be very enjoyable for you guys to share your stories here. I think maybe prior to getting into a couple of questions and then um, the stories, uh, it's obviously a Changing Lawyer Summit, so we are referencing a publication. Uh, and in the area of our focus, there were some data points that I thought would be important to reference. Mm -hmm. um, one uh, broad statement, which I think is, is uh, where we'll kind of, you know, take this uh, directionally, is that a crisis can be a catalyst for positive change. Um, Walter Kluwer did a, uh, a, a particular survey where they identified that 70, 75, 76% of lawyers uh, believe that technology is a key concern for them, uh, while 28% said that their organization is really prepared for it. So kind of a mismatch on that. And then to answer really the, the question here, which is, are lawyers open to adoption, which I think is a bit uh, leading, uh, there is also data that came from the Law 2020 Legal Tech Survey that said pre-pandemic, 40% of lawyers were uh, open to it, whereas now it's 54%. So that being said, uh, much of the article points to efficiency and workflow, reduced operating budget, uh, and then health and well-being of their lawyers. So as you two sit in front of me, I think this would be great to kick it off by asking a question around um, how the pandemic has impacted your approach to adoption, business continuity, or even your perspective on success. Um, so maybe we'll start with Mary on this one again. So basically, I would say how the pandemic has affected us. So we have been able to get more attorneys into training than ever before. I think that that's surprising, first of all. But when we sat down and we really looked at the numbers, it wasn't so much that they had more time. It was just that it was more convenient for them to hop on a Zoom session than it was for them to walk down the hall into a training room. Um, so as far as that goes, that I mean, that was a complete and utter surprise to us. I don't want to talk all the time, so I'm going to leave time for Rick. Yep. Sure, absolutely. I, I think I would certainly echo what Mary said. Uh, you know, I, one of the things that I've learned over the many years I've do, done this is uh, lawyers uh, love training. Uh, actually, that's not true. Right? So, uh, <laughs> they hate training uh, for a couple of good reasons, but I think we had a similar experience uh, when we entered uh, the time of the pandemic. Uh, lawyers were also interested, and for the first time, many of them 
on how to really work effectively remotely. Uh, and then even more importantly, how to work with staff remotely where they didn't have them right down the hall or right next to them. So uh, it really uh, showed them how dependent they were on technology. And I think it really made uh, them made technology more relevant. And I think the adoption and interest in training really is around interest and really relevance to their business. And they saw that uh, pretty clearly this time. So really, I think it really helped us in a number of ways. We, of course, were really ready uh, for remote access, remote remote work. So it really didn't impact us uh, uh, a great deal other than just being physically not uh, together. And, yeah, it, and it, can I agree real quick? Um, I think that is one of the big things is the fact that the attorneys didn't have their LPA right across the hall. And so it was harder to get in contact with that person. So they had to figure out how to do things on their own. Um, kind of the same thing with the, you know, being ready to be remote. Um, we don't really want to put out fires. We want to prevent the fires in the first place. So for example, our firm, we've been VDI 100% for years now. And to the attorneys, it was just, oh, okay, well, whatever that means, you know. For IT, we're like, this is great. It's so easy to rebuild a PC, but you know, that wasn't high priority to them. Well, with the pandemic coming out, it, it was nothing. We just said, hey, if you haven't already been working from home, let us show you how, it's already here. So. I think that that led to a lot more adoption and some right. of the people that probably had that fear of technology, they were forced to get over it, quite honestly. And then realizing they didn't have that support as quickly at their fingertips made them, oh, well, let me maybe try to do this before right. I reach out and ask a question. Right, right. Yeah, as I hear you, you guys talk about this, I lead some internal education here and someone had brought it to my attention that I know it was discussed, I know that you had presented it, but we don't actually recognize its importance until we're experiencing it. Right? Yes. And I think this is kind of a forced experience where at that point in time, you could align education to it and it was, it was pretty well received. Correct, 100% so, agree. So, so knowing that um, it kind of impacted and changed your approach, and again, it was more uh, real time, has, how did you in your last project, probably during this pandemic, define success, right? I think as we consider, <laughs> adoption success, we better define what that actually means and what we're looking to accomplish. So maybe Rick, you could take this one and, and help us understand how you define success and maybe tie it back to your most recent. No, absolutely. So one of the, uh, so I agree with you that adoption and uh, not just uh, perfunctory adoption or mechanical adoption, but true uh, embracing and getting benefit from the tools that we're providing attorneys is really a measure of success. Our most recent uh, major project I, I called uh, we mentioned uh, is TMI. <clears throat> and in this case, it does not mean uh, too much information, although some attorneys thought it meant that, uh, <laughs> but it was a technology modernization initiative that we went through uh, to really bring the, the uh, front office up to speed. And we actually went in the reverse direction from Mary's firm. Uh, we actually went from BDI that was installed, you know, probably a good 10 years ago. Um, and it was working far less effectively than <clears throat> could be or should be. And uh, we actually went to uh, a fat client. We actually put new laptops in front of lawyers and went to Windows 10 and actually uh, used System Center and things to manage that. So we, ha we actually went in the reverse direction, although our remote access is quite effective um, for that. But that project meant upgrading, not just the operating system, but every application. <clears throat> and it, it really touched every practice group uh, and a lot of the you know, many applications that each practice group uses specifically. And I think for me, uh, part of that, it was, a, it was a tighter and a better opportunity for me to interact directly with the lawyers, uh, which I love to do, to, you know, in, in the first place. But there's one instance I can share with you that to me really was a clear example of what I call success. I had one lawyer look across, uh, a senior lawyer look across the desk from me uh, at the you know completion of this project. And I was just talking about kind of the benefits and, and really how this can improve his practice and uh, the practice group that he worked with. And he looked over and leaned in and said, Rick, I've got to tell you, in you know the nearly 30 years I've been practicing law, this is the first time someone in IT has leaned across to me and said, how can I help you in your business? How can I help your practice? And it was the first time someone didn't just say, how can I force some new software or a new piece of hardware on you? But it, it really became relevant to him. And I was actually offering my business solution. And I showed him that I really cared about helping him be successful as a lawyer and not just push technology. That was a light bulb for him. And that was really a, a, a significant example of success. 
And, and I would imagine just on that feedback, that probably lays the groundwork for continued success with future projects, right? Because they know that you're going to take that into consideration. I don't know if you meant to do it, but you did speak to not forcing it, which is actually part of the article that is in the Changing Lawyer Speaks to. That is right. the, the number one piece to do not try to force. Uh, it, it'll probably uh, get started on the wrong foot. Yes. Mary, uh, similar experience uh, in regards to success and, and feedback there or something slightly different? So I think it, it again, it's kind of that forced versus, it's the push versus the pull. So during the pandemic, for example, right when the pandemic hit, we were in the process of moving everyone to a brand new image, um, which is the same as, you know, giving them a whole new computer. We use persistent desktops. So everyone has their own virtual machine. It's just like, just like Rick's environment. These just happen to be in a cloud. Right. Um, the first question we were asked was, are you guys going to move forward with this? Are we going to wait? And we said, no, we're going to keep going. We we have to get this done. You're on a version of Windows that's outdated or going to be outdated. Um, and so we were able to get that done throughout the pandemic. And that was a huge win. But I wouldn't say that the firm saw that as a, as a success because to them, they just kept working. There was nothing different. Um, to IT, it was a huge success. We got it done. Um, we beat the deadlines and everything was great. Um, gave my my college or almost college son something to do too because he he joined in and helped with the bills. Um, oh, nice. Great great little way to you know spend his time. Um, yeah. But the other thing I'm going to say is that when there is a pull by the attorneys, so it's something that they need and we're able to provide that to them, then things measure the success automatically almost. So how do I what do I mean? So we had an attorney join our firm. And there was a product that he was using at his former firm that he said, hey, I want this. And we said, mm, we only have two licenses for that. And it's in our document services department. And he's like, well, I really want this on my desktop. So we began working with a vendor who happens to be Latera um, to get that product in front of more people um, because he was able to ask, act as a champion to that. And he was able to tell us why it was helpful. We were able to share that with the other attorneys in the firm. And that pull made them say, I want to do this too. I want to be more successful myself. So um, we've completed that, that rollout. And I will say that it's been very successful. Um, we've had more and more attorneys say, oh, I want to do that too. Or how did, how did he do that? He just said he, he looked at all the defined terms, you know, just like that. How do I do that? And so um, I think it's the pull versus the push. So what Rick was saying of really listening and solving a problem, I think is very beneficial. So our success measurement for that was basically attorneys talking to each other about the problem. Yes. And so from both of you, I'm hearing anecdotally, there was success related to feedback or you know internal organic growth and conversation. Um, quickly, do either of you have some metrics that, that you are always looking at in regards to either usage or adoption or something to that extent that just kind of you know rise to the top for you and, and, and what you're looking at? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll take this real quick, Rick. So every mm -hmm. month we do get a report of usage stats from some of our products, um, comes from your company. And we are able, we track, and so we can actually track that usage and see that it's either maintaining or going up, depending on what we're doing. And we've been able to tie that. So for example, one of the products we didn't think had very high usage. We took a month, month and a half um, last year, and we said to our trainer, focus on this send out some tips, post some videos, do whatever, but let's see what happens to usage. And guess what usage for that product went up. Um, during our rollout of Latera Check, the usage was up. And so obviously they were just, everyone was trying it out, everyone was using it. So I thought, hmm, what's gonna happen this, this next month when we're not you know, actively pushing and doing training? And I'm happy to say that the number stayed up. It didn't drop dramatically. So there's a few less documents being used, but I'm able to look at those numbers and say, yes, people are using it. And I do get asked that. Um, my IT director will say, are people even using these products? And to be able to actually show him numbers is spectacular. In addition to the time savings, um, we were able to have an LPA say it takes 55 minutes to do this TOA versus the manual way our paralegals are taking eight hours to do it. And so in order to show them that and say, this is a, a a fact and you can save yourself time. But I think one of the fears with some of that, not just attorneys, but your paralegals and everything is um, it's not about working less. It's not about taking their job away. It's about working smarter. And so a lot right. of times you hear people say, well, if it's quicker for me, I'm going to build less time or they're not going to need me as much. Um, it's going to replace my job. I don't think that's the case. I think okay. it's a smarter way to work and using those tools and you're able to do more. So instead of just doing a TOA for one client on one document in one day, now you can do four or five. 
So it's just becoming more efficient. Yeah, I think Mary's absolutely right. I've uh, had the same feedback from lawyers who've really recognized the opportunity cost that was lost by spending more time doing things inefficiently. And so they've really embraced a lot of the tools that will help them do this in less time. And they realize that, no, now they can actually serve clients better. They can actually do more more work for clients uh, and actually uh, uh, just be cognizant of what they're spending uh, in terms of budget for the for the work they're doing for the client. So that, that I, rings true with me as well. Um, we also saw a pretty significant uptick, as I mentioned earlier, in remote access. Uh, you know, we use a VPN connection. We have a few remote desktop services connections, you know, similar to Citrix, but um, and uh, but for the most part, we saw a very significant uptick in VPN access. And I actually had some good conversations with some of the lawyers to understand kind of why they were experiencing or having a more improved use of remote access and VPN. And they said, first of all, I realized that I'm working just like I was at, at the office. So that's really helpful. But frankly, I'm seeing a significant trend in the interest of lawyers to have a life. I mean, they really want to be home for dinner with the family. They really want to be, you know, at Billy's baseball game. I mean, they really want to go to Susie's recital. They really want to spend more time with the family. And that quality of life has become so much more important. Um, and so this traditional you know, let's work 70 hours at the office uh, is just kind of going away. I mean, they're, they'll work uh, late at night, but from home after the kids are in bed, you know, if they have to catch up on something. But we saw a significant uptick on that. We also uh, pleasantly, so I saw a significant uptick in our adoption of document management, uh, which was really helpful. I'm a huge proponent. I'm going to get off on a tangent, which I tend to do sometimes, <laughs> but, do it. Uh, but I'm a big proponent of information governance, you know, data governance, and uh, and document management is certainly a part of that. And when I when I came, I mean, there were certainly uh, all kinds of pockets of information. You know, people kept data on their desktop a lot of times um, right. in some folder locally uh, on a floppy disk. No, I'm not kidding. I floppy disk. <laughs> but I mean, but I mean, they dating myself when I say that. I'm just kidding. Um, but but it was a lot of it was not appropriately so in the um, document management system. So there's been a great adoption about the the use of that where it's appropriate. You know, all the work product right. and correspondence of clients are now there and searchable and and usable. So that was an uptick for us. Yeah, and I think as Mary was speaking, and then again Rick with um, nailing the word, I was thinking of trends there, right? The the ability to recognize trends and then the ability to actually influence the trends just by having yes. some of that data. Right. Um, and and I know Gartner, who's obviously very big in in their data and analytics and so forth, tends to um, speak to the fact that we get so caught up in the dashboard of just metrics that we don't actually look at the story behind it. And mm -hmm. uncovering the story does tell you a lot about how someone is working and you can often uh, empower them to use technology or process or those people, as you had mentioned, right. uh, in, in a far better manner. Um, okay, so uh, before we get into a little bit of the storytelling, uh, I'd also like to really understand how you motivate and inspire lawyers, right? I think. Uh, it's well known that no one wants change for sake of change. Uh, it's largely feared uh, by uh, the human race just in general. So what is it that you have done or any uh, unique approaches that you've taken to really get people excited about what it's going to provide? Maybe, Mary, we'll go back to you to start with this. Oh, okay. Um, so first of all, it's the, I don't want to call it the jealous factor, but um, it is the jealous factor. Yes. So I talked earlier about the attorneys that, like the product or use the product, telling other attorneys about it. It's that fear of missing out, FOMO as they call it, you know, the cool people. Um, so we all want to be like or do as well as someone else. I mean, that's everyone from your LPA to your attorney. And so if an attorney feels that someone else is able to do something better than him or her, they want to know, why can't I do that? And now I want to try it. It's the old, the attorney who takes a laptop to a meeting and doesn't turn it on or know how to use it, but they have that laptop like everybody else is sitting right in front of them. And this is from a long time ago, not now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think some of the things that, you know, that really drive and get people excited about the learning has to do with what others are saying. And, you know, when you're online, when you're on a social, you know, messaging board or something like that, what are you looking at? You're looking at what other people are doing. And so if the attorneys here, other attorneys in the firm are able to do this and they're able to do it efficiently 
and it's working well for them, they want to do it too. Um, some other fun things that we did, um, we provided gift cards. We had some drawings for gift cards with our last one. I don't want to go too much into stories, but um, those are some other things. You can't provide food because we're all remote. So, you know, we could send a DoorDash gift card or something like that, but some of us live in areas where, you, what, can you get McDonald's? You know, that might be it. So um, we did some drawings for some different gift cards. You know, if you, hey, if you attended these classes, you're in a drawing for this. If you attended these, you're in a right, drawing for right. that. If you filled out the evaluation, there was a bigger one. So um, everyone likes gift cards, so yeah. I believe it. And, and yep. it sounds, you say jealousy, but I hear a lot of competition there, right? Uh, I, I was working with a firm who was, we were building an ROI study and, and one of the comments there was, do not underestimate how competitive this industry is, these individuals are. Um, so not surprised to hear that. Rick, uh, how about you? Yeah. Well, hold on, I wanna throw on one more thing. Um, the one thing about Robinson Bradshaw is that our firm is a little bit different than most. Um, we don't, the attorneys, they all share clients, like clients don't belong to an attorney or anything like that. So sometimes you think the competition isn't there because our attorneys work a lot differently than other firms. But I think it's all that individual psychological competition. So, sorry, go ahead. Love no, I, I echo and agree with that. Mary, you're spot on with the idea of, uh, I, I like what you said, is you know the, the fear of missing out, you know, the FOMO factor, I completely agree. And uh, also agree with this, uh, principal characteristic that lawyers have of being competitive. Uh, and some people say, are lawyers competitive be, uh, you know, because they were lawyers or do they become lawyers because they're competitive? Yeah, so maybe there's a, you know, a little bit of a mix there. Um, but name. yeah, so we similarly over the years I've done this, I have been very successful in, uh, cause I have a lot of my closest friends are lawyers. Uh, so a lot of my best lawyer jokes are actually from lawyer friends of mine, uh, <laughs> which I won't go into. But uh, what I've been able to do is um, really establish a relationship, a connection with them and help them uh, with a new tool or a new process or something that is really of benefit to them. And they're not bashful about showing it off. And so you're absolutely right. I mean, they they show what others, you know, what they can do. And then those around them uh, want the same thing. And so it really starts to catch on. And then I start getting a lot of demand for the same thing. And it just uh, becomes kind of contagious in a good way. So super, super excited about kind of how that works. Um, it, we had a, a very successful last month. I mean, probably, you know, October was National Cybersecurity Awareness Month and uh, uh, information security is near and dear to my heart. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's really important that you create uh, a security conscious or a security culture of awareness among everyone, right? That's everyone's got to be their own human firewall per se, uh, super important, clearly. And I was really surprised to see we had uh, a majority of our lawyers, which is I expected just a fraction of them to participate. Uh, you know, we're an AMLA 200 firm. And so I thought, you know, they're busy. They're not going to participate. You know, we did a theme each week uh, related to password security uh, and then related to confidentiality, related to uh, uh, social engineering. And then the last week wrapped up with just personal security. You know, how do you actually keep your, your you know, banking and your online purchases secure as well? And so, uh, and we had, posters and information and, and we did a, a pretty good job and had fun doing it um, but we had cash prizes and we gave away an ipad mini um, at the end of the month for those who participated in all of the training and it was brief you know it was like five ten minute training videos um, and then we had a trivia question each week that you had to complete based on the training and it was actually a, a lot of you know we gamification quite a bit and i was surprised yeah. to see how much uh, participation we got from lawyers you know, high percentage of staff, but also high percentage of lawyers jumped in. They wanted an iPad. Um, and we had a chance to really help them create a greater security awareness at the same time. So, yeah, uh, you know, it's still to this day, my my top LinkedIn post was uh, something that I had shared that kind of showed the uh, different approaches that you could take to passwords and actually how just a phrase is more difficult to crack than any of the others. But I think, yeah. um, you know, security is, is sexy in many ways. People do get excited about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, when and, I tried to share that with people, I, I you know, and uh, we originally went to a much longer uh, password than uh, they were used to. They were used to an eight character minimum. We made that significantly longer. And I had some initial groaning and some of the senior <laughs> lawyers especially said, it's impossible. I can't remember a password that long. And I looked at them and I said, can you remember something like my cat likes to eat butter in the garage, you know, or something like? I said it's like it's like twenty five characters. Just, so they said, yeah, I could do that. That makes sense. So that makes sense. Perfect. And All right. Well, free stuff, right? 
it, yes. it seems that way. Yes, it seems that way. Absolutely. Um, okay, so I'm, I'll share a, a quick little story, and then I think we have uh, just under six minutes here, uh, maybe for the two of you to, to share an approach. And and my hope is that not only you can talk about something successful, but maybe even what was not successful, as that um, helped govern some of the um, the ways that we have approached our our adoption and change right. management projects with our our team. Right. Um, just off of of the coattails, of what we're saying, I uh, I worked with the firm uh, a while back who recognized that for lawyers to find uh, a desire to use that technology or to consider it innovative, it needs to be something that they could leverage during their pitch decks or pitches to, to clients, right? So I actually had the luxury of um, going with a managing partner of, of a, a large law firm uh, to their biggest client in their boardroom to show it off and really show, okay, this is what we're doing. Um, but that was really what they were trying to capture there is that if we can get technology to be something that our lawyers are promoting, then we have absolutely hit their motivation and, and their need for it, right? Because they're bringing in business. Yes. So uh, do either of you have uh, an adoption story that you have in mind that you'd like to start off with that maybe you could share with the greater audience? I do, but I'm going to ask Mary first. I mean, certainly. I was uh, going to let you go first this time. Oh, okay. All right. Thank yeah, you Mary. keep letting ladies go first. I'm going to turn over to Yep. So uh, I was recruited in a few, you know, several years back by a firm in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and... <clears throat> Uh, interesting. I wasn't looking for a job, and they they pulled me away. Um, and we had a, we had a joy, a joy, enjoyed a uh, uh, our time in Colorado. Uh, but uh, I was there for less than a month, uh, and it was a fairly large firm. We had something like fourteen offices, and uh, you know far bigger than the firm I'm, I'm with now. And uh, I was uh, there for a month, invite and invited to participate in the a lawyer retreat that was held in Las Vegas, uh, and. I sat there all weekend uh, listening to all the different practice groups uh, talk about how they were going to succeed, you know, what they were going to do to grow their business. We had marketing come up and talk, you know, we had the managing director come in and talk about how he's going to grow the firm. Um, we had a couple of the guest people come in and just talk about how we can actually make lawyers better lawyers and make us more efficient. I was the last guy to talk. So um, I'm a CIO. Uh, and so it's, and of course, everyone went long, everyone went longer than they should. You know? And so I'm the last on the agenda for the, for the entire event. And people are waiting for massage appointments or tea times, you know, to go and play golf or whatever. The last thing they want to do is listen to an IT guy talk about what's happening with technology. And so I came up to the platform and I'm addressing, you know, there's a few hundred people actually in the audience, you know, all lawyers. And I said, I want to, you know, First of all, I introduced myself, and they, so I said, you know, that's who I am and what I'm doing. But I said, I, I, I've listened all weekend to all your plans to help grow and make this business and help this firm succeed. And I will tell you, good technology will not guarantee the success of this firm. And then I, and then I just paused for probably about five, six seconds, which might have seemed like an eternity. And they're all leaning forward like, what does he, where is he going with this? And then I said, Yes, good technology will not guarantee the success of this firm, but bad technology is certainly going to inhibit it. And they all breathed a sigh of relief and they all nodded and said yes, because they had experienced some, a substantial amount of pain. Um, and so I, I spoke for about another 15 minutes talking about where we were, how we got there, what I needed to do to change it, and the, the questions that they really want answered. And I know this for all, from doing this for so many years is, what are you gonna do? Why are you gonna do it? How's it gonna benefit me? How long is it going to take you? And what's the last question? How much is this going to cost? Uh, and so I really covered those in bullet point in about 15 minutes. And I walked away with approval to spend $5 million on an infrastructure project. Um, so probably the best 15 minutes I ever spent. Uh, and that was a really, really good adoption. It ended up being an 18 month project um, that uh, was really, really well adapted. And uh, when I left there, I was recruited away again to a firm in Minneapolis. Um, the managing director came to me and he said, Rick, I want to tell you, I will never forget what you've done for this firm. Thank you. So uh, that 15 minutes in Las Vegas really paid off. <laughs> All right, Mary, I'll give you an opportunity and I'll wrap us up. Yeah, I'll say, I feel like I've kind of shared little mini adoption stories throughout this entire 30 minutes. So I don't want to take a ton of time. Um, I will just say that the successful adoptions that we have had are all of those where we have involved the end users, be it the attorneys, the LPAs, everyone within the firm. Yep. Um, the ones that have not been as successful are those that we have done that 
I don't want to say IT, but someone is just pushing for their own agenda. Uh, we've seen things fail over the years where one attorney says, I want this software and he's an important person. So we get that software and it sits on people's desks for three years. We pay for it and no one ever uses it. Um, and we try, we, we do what we need to do, but it, it has to have an end user kind of behind it. And it's not just one person. It has to be a whole group of people. So I think for, for me, what I will say is that our last project, well, the last one I worked on, I'm working on a gazillion of them right now, but the last one was our big deployment of some software. And the, the way that we got it done was the attorneys as champions, them spreading the word and sharing with people. And I think that if you do that, I think that you can make almost any project successful, not just one, you've got to have a lot. Yeah. And a, a lot of what you guys are saying seems like you have uh, built a rapport. You've kind of laid the groundwork for future projects. I know we didn't get to it, but Rick, uh, I know you subscribe to a, a particular radio station, which I think also uh, is kind of the theme of this, if you yeah, could share that. Yeah. 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 So you're going to say, and I learned a long time ago, and this is not, you know, it's probably a cliche and probably not something that I invented, but I do agree that everyone listens to radio station WIIFM, right? So it's what's in it for me. And really to dovetail and agree completely with what Mary said, um, people have to understand what's in it for them. And you're only going to get that if you communicate and involve them. And to your point, Mary, I think it was beautiful. You said it beautifully. If there is no involvement in a project, there's no commitment to making it succeed. Um, and you know, people can end up being passive aggressive, saying, you know what, I had no say in that. I'd never, you know, they didn't include me. So I'm not going to you know, really be a champion for it. But when you make people, when you involve people and listen to them and help them understand what's really in it for them, make it relevant, make it interesting, make it beneficial, uh, that's when they get on board and they end up being your champions. I mean, they end up being your evangelists for the rest of the firm and actually getting people on board. Well, I'll tell you from my point, what's in it for me, uh, I appreciate you guys joining this session today. Uh, it turned this into a, a heavy success. I know that there's an audience of folks out there who have struggled with adoption or change uh, and may not recognize every single day that they're in the same boat as many people have found success. Mm -hmm. And I think if everyone follows kind of the uh, plan that you set out to them uh, or set out in front of them, everybody should get that $5 million budget approved and, and on with their next project. Right. All right. Well, I appreciate you guys joining. Thanks again. This wraps up our session today and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Very helpful. Thank you, Rick, Matt, and Mary for those great tips. Great tips for sure. Matt, you had actually mentioned some friendly competition is always a good thing. So I was thinking we're inching towards the end of our summit today. So I'm so curious to know who's been with me the longest here today. How many sessions have you attended? Go ahead and share with us in the chat. Let's see who's attended the longest. And if you'd like, share your organization and your location as well. Our next session, we'll try to answer some of your questions on market trends, questions on returning to the office, a definite hot topic, data protection and governance, cloud versus on-prem, and so much more. Hello. Hello. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. I'm Sherry Capel. I am a, an evangelist here at Latera. Uh, I'm outside of Chicago, so it's a little bit early, late evening. <laughs> um, and I want to introduce our session um, and our presenter, our honored guest, um, because one of the things about the market trends is that there's pressure on really both sides. There's pressure within the law firms, there's pressure from the, the actual, you know, the corporate clients. And basically we needed to bring uh, to bear here the market trends that that's really around all of it. And so uh, we have an honored guest today. And before I introduce him, Damien, I wondered if you would go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm so glad you're gonna be like, helping me with this session. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so I'm Damien Black and I run a global marketing programs for the transaction business unit and the litigation business unit here at Latera. Uh, happy to have just finished my fifth anniversary in the legal tech space. and. Uh, you know, came from the law firm world before that on the administration side. So happy to be here. 
Thank you. And our honored guest is is someone who gets to speak about both the law firm and the corporate side, uh, corporate legal, uh, George Rudoy. So George, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and also tell us a little bit about your background. Like, like I'm really curious, how can you speak about all of it? Well, Sherry, thank you so much. And Damien, appreciate the introduction. Uh, uh, as uh, Sherry mentioned, uh, I've been in the space for quite some time. It's my 28th year in the industry. Um, so I started uh, with law firms uh, back in the mid 90s. Uh, now, back in the day, anything that had to do with support for legal, uh, especially around technology processes, were all within law firms. And so I spent 15 years with law firms in various capacities, starting as a legal assistant and then using my background as a technologist to slowly is into this uh, a legal IT or legal support uh, on the way sort of towards that discovery turn into e-discovery. So obviously this was a hot topic to jump on. And so I spent a lot of time uh, with few colleagues of mine in the industry shaping that uh, deliverable. And then eventually when I got to my last law firm, which is Sherman and Sterling, um, I was actually able to expand a bit beyond legal technology and started working more on the operational side, uh, which included a variety of different things for a law firm, including the go-to-market strategy and the pricing and uh, records management, and knowledge management, all that good stuff. And as a result of that engagement, I was able to spend a lot of time with the firm's clients, uh, which kind of made sense at the time, uh, which kind of pushed me towards uh, uh, opening my own consultancy and doing that directly for those clients. And so essentially, Sherry, to your point, I've kind of done my time with law firms, so to speak, and eventually started working with corporations. And that's the reason uh, the model that I have right now at Crow is a hybrid between two. George, I, I, I feel that you are in the center of literally every tech trend, but, but every business trend um, that, that finds itself on a law firm's doorstep or, or within the corporate side, you know, the things that they're wanting to drive their law firms to do. So we are absolutely honored to have you here to talk about this uh, mm -hmm. tonight. Damien. Yeah, no, to Sherry's point, uh, George, I think it, you are in the thick of everything. And so it'd be really interesting if you could give us some information about the practice that you established at Crow and then the kind of engagements that you're bringing into the law firms and the corporate legal teams that you're working with. Sure. Happy to share. So the name of the practice is Legal Management Consulting. It's actually becoming more of a standard for legal operations support. So consulting obviously speaks for itself. Legal management implies uh, two sides of support for uh, legal departments, corporate legal departments and, and the law firms, which is the proactive and the reactive. And, and in the proactive sense, we work with uh, corporate legal departments and law firms to address their operational needs. And I'll get a little bit more in detail what that means. But on the reactive side, uh, we are happy to continue providing the services that I mentioned earlier. I mean, it's essentially it comes naturally when you get engaged by the corporations or by law firms and you start having conversations about their operations when the actual needs come around. Uh, if a law firm gets a new uh, case or a corporation gets a, a document request or a subpoena, we are naturally there to support them with uh, the reactionary uh, 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 sort of the reactive um, uh, services like e-discovery, like info governance, like cyber, uh, and so on and so forth. So for the sake of this conversation, it's good to know where that pressure is sort of coming from and, and why is it that a corporation needs to engage us or a law firm needs to engage us. So what we've observed in the past probably 10 years or so that the business side is putting a lot more pressure on the legal departments to be more in line with the business model. I, I have a feeling that when I started in this field, uh, 
legal departments were pretty much were left on their own and uh, obviously considered an expense and and sort of a bunch of lawyers that nobody really wanted to deal with. But uh, it has changed. It has changed to a point that the costs around managing legal department and associated services continues to grow. And so the uh, businesses are now looking very closely at their legal departments and asking questions about what can you do with less? What type of technology are you implementing? How are you insourcing? How are you outsourcing? How are you tracking outsourcing? And so legal departments find themselves in a new kind of uh, situation where they actually need to get themselves a bit more organized and the decisions that they make uh, would help them be able to report back to business based on those needs and based on those pressures. It's interesting to note that when we get engaged for these projects, that is to help the corporate legal departments to get organized, to mainstream their legal operations, to implement technologies, to introduce dashboards. We actually get hired by both parties, uh, depending on the situation. Sometimes we get hired by a C-suite to uh, really bring the legal department in line with what they're expecting. And sometimes we actually hired directly by the legal departments as a sort of a way of finding help to respond to pressures from the uh, uh, business side. And uh, regardless of how we get engaged, that pressure kind of rolls uh, towards outsourcing as well. And so as a result of it, the law firms that already kind of utilize our help uh, to run their own legal operations and to determine pricing and uh, go to market strategy, they engage us as well in a situation where a corporate legal department puts together an RFI or an RFP, or they simply talk to their preferred law firm about improving sort of that channel to assure that all these protocols and procedures that we are implementing for the corporate side are also reflected on the law firm side. So one way or the other, I guess, I cannot get out of the law firm world, not that I ever tried. Uh, and so we get engaged that way as well. Now, the interesting thing is, and, and I, I jokingly call it marriage counseling, it's actually the, the, the uh, space that we like to navigate because as the relationships change and the standards change and the requirements change, a lot can be lost in translation between law firms and the corporate legal department. So a good example is uh, dashboards and exchange of information. So you imagine when a corporate legal department determines how they want to outsource, they actually have technology that we help them implement and law firms have to be in line for that, right? So there are preferred relationships in place already. There are, you know, situations where an associate would go to a corporation and become a part of the corporate legal department and continues to work with the original law firm. All that is in place and now it needs to be kind of upgraded in terms of usage of technology procedures and protocols. So. Uh, again, I jokingly call it marriage counseling. There's really not much disagreements there, but it's sort of they need sometimes a third party to figure out how to do this in the best possible way. So if I may just interject something here. When Crow released the press release about the establishment of the practice that you're doing, uh, I remember reading it and it was talking about digital transformation. And I was like, this is perfect. They found George because he is the transformer of the transformers and i just thought it was just such a perfect thing um and such a great place to crow itself i agree uh it's a great firm um it, the way that the firm is assembled and how we work together is paramount right so i mentioned earlier in these relationships when you kind of sit behind the firewall the conversations that are happening both on the law firm side and the corporate side often involve other topics. So for example, if there is an information governance model that's being discussed, uh, sometimes uh, it makes sense to explore other sort of services that are congruent with it. For example, how is your cyber set up, right? Uh, how are you responding to litigations and how is your change management working when an IT decides that they're gonna change a protocol on their end and how it's gonna influence a corporate legal department. The good news about Crow is because we are collaborating 
to a fault. Yeah, that's kind of the internal definition. It's good to bring colleagues on board that have those experiences and expertise and allow to add to that sort of relationship that's already been established with legal management consulting. Uh, since legal management consulting by itself is an umbrella of services as defined by CLOP, we like to call it an extended umbrella when other services come in and help out because at the end of the day, the relationship is everything and, and the ability to bring additional resources in that relationship is paramount. So before Damien uh, takes us into the whole segment on the trends, the market trends themselves, you told us both about a memo, something that happened in June of this year, um, a, a, some, a memo from Morgan Stanley. So, so tell us about that and how that's impacted this conversation and these market trends. So probably most of the folks that are listening to us and uh, watching us remember that. It, it's, it's been a little bit of a anomaly given the world we live in today, a bit of a bombshell, I would say. Uh, Morgan Stanley released a memo that pretty much in a summary says, if you want to ever work for us, law firms, make sure that your associates are in the office. It, essentially, that was the message. Uh, uh, I can certainly understand the uh, preference of a client like that to uh, put a little bit of a pressure on law firms. Uh, I think the timing was kind of everything because we're in, in between the waves and the Delta wasn't really around that much at the time. But nevertheless, it created quite a splash. So all our clients started asking us to get involved in this sort of a decision that they have to make. And the decision wasn't easy. It wasn't just the fact that your client tells you to do something, so you do it. Law firms are pretty used to that. The problem that that is happening right now is because of the sort of a trends in the market and everything that happened, the associates are absolutely in a high demand, right? And we heard all these stories about, you know, trying to maintain price, you know, uh, and, and, and the budgets around services with the ability to keep the associates, uh, the salaries that at least somewhat normalized. So as you can imagine, here's the ABC law firm getting that memo and your clients telling you, you better bring your associates to the office and here your associates are telling you, okay, if you want to bring me to the office, I can go and get another job somewhere in another firm and get paid a lot more money. And so what do you do as a law firm where your client tells you, bring them into the office and your associates are telling you, we have options. So that's essentially what started this conversation back in June. Damien? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so uh, Mark, we just wanted to touch on like, what are the trends that people are actually interested in right now? I'm sorry, is that a question for me? Yeah. Okay. George. I'm yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's a question okay. for you. I, um, yeah, I'm just, I, I know that, you know, we've been talking about a lot of trends today uh, the, across the entire industry, but Sherry and I wanted to get your perspective specifically on what people are really actually interested in right now. Like, what are you hearing when you're sitting in the middle of that and doing that marriage counseling? So again, as we continue to navigate two sides of that equation, uh, on the corporate side, the trends are, I would, I would say, continue to be uh, of doing more with less, implementing technology processes and protocols, right? Uh, these are the things that are not new, but the pressure is escalating a little bit where there is a need to have a more predictable processes for the legal departments and a little bit more of a predictable budget, right? And so this is the biggest trend on the corporate side is that the attorneys are starting to take this seriously and not kind of saying, okay, well, I'm going to deal with this until the next cycle. Mm -hmm. I think the additional perspective on the corporations following that protocol is the fact that the, uh, young attorneys that are graduating from law, law schools no longer sort of do this 
law firm, seven years at the law firm to corporation, right? There is now an increasing number of uh, graduates from law school that go directly into corporations. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a symbol of times, right? Is the, the folks feel that they want to be in the corporate world and they want to have a specific lifestyle as opposed to, you know, sort of a predictable associate seven year run. And I think that helps resolve the responding to that pressure, right? So that that's the trend that helps a corporate legal department to actually work with someone who is much more technologically inclined and, you know, much more adaptable because there's not that sort of a preset uh, mentality of going through a law firm into a corporation. Yeah. On the law firm side, we see general trends of law firms kind of going in two separate directions. One direction is law firms are getting bigger and uh, continue to consolidate, which means that they now operating in many more markets and it's getting bigger generally, like Denton's, for example, is a good, is a good example to, uh, to display. So again, they need more protocols and procedures and technology just to keep going in that direction. And then there is an outliers out there among law firms that actually become virtual or semi-virtual. So there's less of that dependency on the centralized traditional model, which obviously, uh, it relies on implementation of protocols, procedures, and technology as well. Right. Go ahead, Damien. Yeah, I would just wanted to touch on another thing that we haven't really covered today in any of the conversations, and that's how is the you know cloud versus on-prem situation panning out as people have moved to more of a remote work and they're coming up with those hybrid models? How are they managing that? going forward so as technology in general moving in cloud and the attorneys are getting less and less concerned with that you know potential exposure of data given that it's a proven technology given it's been around for a while and given that the sort of a cyber side of it sometimes is a lot more secure than uh, on-prem installations it resolves a lot of issues that originally were an obstacle for people to work remotely so if you think about it and the ability to work remotely, especially uh, within a sort of a set of technology that needs to be secure, given the confidentiality and privilege and, and, and sort of that type of protection. I think at the end of the day, if there is a good explanation to a client that uh, this is implemented in such a way that the data is secure, there is a lot less concern from a client side, right? And, and making it all the way back to that memo that we talked about, I don't exactly know what sort of precipitated that public request, but it's certainly not technology, right? Because you can be at home these days and have a pretty standard connection and law firms are implementing, you know, proper technology to assure that everything is, is secure and safe. As a matter of fact, the new protocols are such that whether you're working from home or where you're working in the office, the environment is exactly the same. And so I think that's how the law firms are addressing an ability to work from home, because at least from the technological perspective, it's not an issue. Now, the collaboration, seeing people in person, spending time with a partner, sitting in a conference room, you know, you can do it virtually to whatever degree people can adopt a virtual environment that way and have the same type of efficiency. That's another conversation. But from the technology perspective, I think, Damien, that's what you're asking me. That's mm -hmm. kind of enabled that ability to work remotely. So, George, we we have just a couple of minutes left. And I, I think one of the things uh, Damien and I hoped you could share with our audience, since we have folks from law firms and from corporate legal, and, and if you were to give them, you know, recommendations about moving from, say, a a spot in in legal operations to you know a bigger role like what what advice would you give them because you yourself have moved through that and uh wondered what you might say to them today so i would hate to be overly practical but i think that's sort of the way to go here uh, i think at the end of the day uh folks in that position need to be 
you know, a revenue maker and not, and not an expense. And I think that would make, that makes the most difference. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, during my journey, uh, I originally obviously was an expense to a firm until such time that by a combination of the actual billable work that we did and the fact that we helped the uh, case teams close business uh, made us much more sort of valuable to the uh, to a firm. And when you do that, when you show that you can help a law firm with the business side of it, you actually get opportunities uh, to do more. And, it, and it's a typical law firm formula. I mean, I've been out now from a law firm for 11 years, but I doubt anything's changed. If you are valuable and you're actually showing results and if you're impacting the revenue, uh, the folks will ask you to do more and more. And as a result, that sort of umbrella of legal management consulting that we provide can essentially be implemented internally. And, and by the way, we do that work as well. We work with key people at law firms to help them navigate that and help them build those services internally so they can be more successful and, and have an impact on the bottom line. Make yourself indispensable. Exactly. Exactly. Damien, anything else? No, I think we're about out of time. We're trying to uh, just make sure that we're running on schedule because we have our closing keynote coming up soon. So I hope everyone that's on here is going to stick around for that. George, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us. Thanks so much, George. Right. Wonderful to talk with you tonight. Have a good night. Bye.